life is dominated by randomness. My own career in science uh, has been a bit random. The reason I'm an accidental biologist is because I'm not a biologist at all. I'm actually a physicist. And uh, when I started my, my career in science, I was interested in things like chaos theory and general relativity, the theory of gravity and so on. And it was only in the middle of my PhD that I first uh, encountered biology when I accidentally met a neuroscientist who told me how neurons work and how cells connect to make the brain work. And I thought this was completely amazing stuff. And so I ended up teaching myself biology and then through another series of random walks, I've ended up here in a biology institution um, as a physicist studying how, how cells uh, work. And I'm proud to call myself a biologist if they will have me. So it's not just our lives at the macroscopic scale that's uh, dominated by randomness. In fact, randomness permeates uh, through all scales, from molecules all the way up to large objects. So what I've shown you here is a late 19th century toy, a statistical demonstration. It's called a Galton board or a bean machine. You might have seen things like this on YouTube. Um, on the left side is the before and the right side is the after. So the way this works is there's a funnel on top. It's full of tiny little balls. And the balls are released through a series of pegs and every time it hits a peg, each ball can go left or go right. Uh, and since each ball takes a different path, eventually all the balls fall into different bins at the bottom. So if you run this experiment through, what happens at the end is you get this wonderful famous bell-shaped curve. Uh, and the point is that some balls end up in one bin and some balls end up in the other and some end up right in the middle. Now the reason I'm telling you this is because you can do the same experiment but at the microscopic scale. I've done this experiment where instead of balls you think of cells. And what you're thinking about when you see left and right is not cells going left and right. It's if a cell gains a molecule, it goes in one direction. If a cell loses a molecule, it goes in another direction. And what happens when you do this experiment is exactly like the balls. Every cell takes a different path. And so when you finish the experiment, some cells have a lot of proteins that are on the right side of this bin. Some cells have very few proteins that are on the left side. And they form this bell-shaped curve. So the reason I'm telling you this is just to say that in biology, you can never expect the same event to end up the same way. If you repeat it, things happen differently. There's microscopic sloppiness everywhere. Given this fact, we can then ask, how precise is life? So before we can answer that question, we have to first decide how to quantify precision. So I'm going to teach you how to do that a little bit. To think about precision, you have to think about what happens when the same action is repeated twice, right? So to pick a very simple uh, picture, you know, imagine a golfer. So she stands up at the golf ball, she takes a swing, she hits the ball, ball goes somewhere, puts another ball down, takes a swing, ball goes somewhere else. Where will the second ball land? How far away from the first one? Now, even if you remove wind and all kinds of environmental variables, even the best professional golfer will probably not get it to within one foot of the original ball. But let's say that's the level of variance there is, right? So about a foot or 25 centimeters. At a completely different scale, we have uh, the New Horizons probe, which was recently uh, made a splash in the headlines because it reached Pluto. And uh, when the probe reached somewhere near Pluto, it turned on its radio and wired back to Earth saying, here, this is where I am. And it wasn't far from where it was supposed to be. Well, it was 75,000 kilometers off from where it was supposed to be. So which one of these is more precise? Well, you can't really answer that question until you realize that precision has to do not just with the variation, which is the red, but with the size of the baseline, which is the size of the white scale over here. So once you put that down, then the picture changes completely, right? So now I want to define precision as the percent sameness when an action is repeated. And so when you think about it that way, this incredible professional golfer has 99.9% .9 precision, but the New Horizons space probe has 99.9999% precision, one in a million. That's precision. So now I've told you how to quantify precision, how to measure it, how to put a number to it. So I'm going to get back to my original question. How precise is life? And now that we know the protocol, it's actually very easy. To check how precise life is, you have to repeat the same action twice and see how different it is. And in biology, such things do happen. So the real question you should be asking is, how different are you from your identical twin? So I'm going to show you what the data would look like. There aren't too many twins around, but these kinds of measurements have been made. And just so we have something to measure that we can all sort of understand, I'm going to talk about a very simple measurement. I'm going to talk about our palms. So the measurement I'm going to do is I'm going to take a very good ruler and I'm going to measure some sort of feature on your palm, like the distance from the bottom to one of the lines across your palm or something like that. And I'm going to ask you to measure that line on your palm and then on the palm of, let's say, your sibling, not your identical twin, your brother or sister. And what I've plotted here on this graph is the length of that feature for you on the x-axis and the length for your brother or sister on the y-axis, your sibling, non-identical. What you find is there is a lot of variation. Of course, you're not the same. And so if your palm is about 5 centimeters or 50 millimeters long, the amount of variation you see is about, you know, could be a couple of centimeters. 
20 millimeters. So this doesn't seem very precise. But that wasn't the experiment we were supposed to do, right? So I said, look at twins. And when you look at twins, all this variation collapses. Okay? So whatever line feature you measure on your palm, if you measure it on your twin's palm, if you had a twin, it would be almost the same. That's why you get this very tight white line. And the width of that line is just about half a millimeter on a 50 millimeter baseline. Now, you don't have to take my word for this, because luckily you can actually do this experiment yourself. Turns out, the amount of variation there will be between you and your twin, if he or she existed, is the same as there is between your right palm and your left palm. So you can stare at your palms and check how much error there is. And it's amazing, I do this all the time, um, <laughs> it's amazing how close to a mirror image they are. And you can check this yourself and take, not take my word for it, but the variation is a fraction of a millimeter for most of the lines on your palm. Not fingerprints, but the lines on your palm. So let's put this back. New Horizons probe, controlled by Mission Control, reaches Pluto within 75,000 kilometer variation. Professional golfer hits a shot and if he or she is very good, about a foot variation. And the line on your palm, controlled by your DNA somehow, by the time it finishes from start to end, has about half a millimeter error. And if we talk about precision, you're talking about 99% precision. On top, 99.9 .9 in the middle, 99.9999 on the bottom. So now I can ask, fine, we know life is 99% precise. Is that surprising? Is that what you expected? Does it make sense? So to think about this, you have to think a little harder. Because all we've done so far is make an observation and quantify it. We haven't yet done any science. And to think about it, I'm going to bring up a metaphor. So here's a scene you see on many street corners in many countries. Right? You see these artists who sit and draw portraits of visiting tourists and so on. And uh, here's the painting on the right here that the artist drew earlier. It's actually a very detailed picture of somebody's palm. This artist draws people's palms. The twist is if you notice, the subject's palms are not visible because he's got them hidden. So what does the artist do? The artist asks the subject to describe his palm. He says, tell me what your palm looks like and I'm going to try and draw it. And then based on what the subject says, the artist starts sketching and finishes up and what you get is the palm. What is this metaphor I'm bringing up actually? The subject is the DNA, the person giving the instructions. The artist who might mishear what you said, his hand shakes, he doesn't have the right color of paint, that's the sloppiness of biology, the sloppy random protein machinery. It works, but it's not completely precise. But what you get of the outcome is the palm. Now, if you saw somebody doing this on the street and you saw this picture coming out, you, you would just stop and say, how are you doing that? And you would ask the subject on the left side, what language are you using? How are you saying this? And the fact is, although we've sequenced thousands and we're going to be sequencing millions of genomes, we don't actually know the language in which the genomes are written. We don't know the language in which the instructions are being given. We know some of it and we're learning much more. So again, is 99% precision surprising? Here's the question you have to ask yourself. Could you instruct a street artist, literally, to draw your palm to 99% precision just by using English words? Just think about this for a little while and you realize how amazing it is that biology manages to achieve it. It is surprising. I saw a sign on a campus once in Bangalore. It said, to a poet, a rose is something to be wondered at. But to a scientist, it's something to be crushed and analyzed. <laughs> and I wish I would taken a picture of it. And obviously that's not true. Like all these other creative endeavors, science is about observation and metaphor. Observation like we did, we looked at palms, we quantified it. But the observation on its own is meaningless unless we have a picture through which to interpret it. And we can think of life as a satellite or as a golfer or as a street artist making a painting. All these metaphors are useful. They tell us something about how things work. It's through the metaphors that we can decide whether something is surprising or not. Now, I urge you to just look again at ordinary things in life and be surprised. And then you'll know what it's like to be a scientist. Thank you.